uh, this is State of Mind. And um, if, you, if you like what you see, hit this little this little thing right here. Bap, 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 bap. Um, I'm with someone who I hadn't seen in over 30 years. And she's incredibly talented. We're going to get into all that stuff. But she, she screen tested for all my children when I was Nico Kelly. Is that the right? Is that his last name, Nico Kelly? <laughs> I don't even know. So she was supposed to come on as my girlfriend, but I guess after she got the role, because she was the best for the role, she was most talented, uh, and we were supposed to work. I guess we didn't work together after she got the role, which is ridiculous. Anyway, this is Liz Vassie. How you doing? I'm doing really well. It's nice to see you. Damn. Dang. Wait, before we get into me, I just want to say something right off the bat. I am so impressed that you're doing this. I, I did a deep dive. I know you, you went online and did a deep dive into my life. I've done a deep dive into yours. This show is so impressive. You are destigmatizing and normalizing talking about mental health. You are to be applauded. I think you are saving lives. Wow. I'm so impressed with you. So um, I just wanted to say that right off the bat. I, I am a fan of yours. Wow. Although, can I call you Mo? Do I know you Everybody well enough? To, I know, but you okay. were Maurice when I met you. So I right, don't know. but here's the deal with this Mo thing. Okay. And I just had this conversation. Who did I have it with? Oh my God. <laughs> That's right. Nobody called me Mo growing up. And I had a friend named Mo. I was Maurice. short for anything or just No, his name was Mo. Wow. Like he was born and his parents Mo went let's Moises. See. Okay. Moises. What the what, forget I forget his name. And it's Mo. Mo 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 Pagan was his name. And my name was Mauricio. Okay? Everybody called me that or Maurice or sexy because I had dimples and stuff. And then... <laughs> I had that nickname too. No. <laughs> no, so, sadly, I did not. <laughs> so then I get all my children, and then Michael Knight says, Mo. And I got to be honest with you, I didn't love it because I had a friend named Mo. You know, so yeah. it's not my favorite. And then I go to General Hospital, the hit show, you know, awesome. <laughs> 30, 30 years have been calling me Mo. Let's talk about you a little bit. Um, you grew up, what, what's up, how? Uh, I Wait, was... Tell, just tell me your story you just told me. Let's get into that. <laughs> Which Briefly one? Tell, the one when you got the job and it saved... Oh, yeah, well, it, you know, before... Well, before that, I just because uh, one thing that I think is is worth mentioning, it's just I, I think it's so so odd why we all get into this business because it's yeah. just a crazy business, and I think a lot of people have this sort of misconception that actors come tap dancing out of the womb and desperately want to be in front of everybody and are just show people. And um, for me, I was born in North Carolina, and I uh, got very sick at the age of two. Yes, I had something called hemolytic uremic syndrome, which right. just sort of rolls off the tongue. It was liver and kidney disease caused by E. coli. So I went into the hospital gregarious as a child. I don't remember it, obviously, but, you know, from everything my mom said, I was just, you know, I loved to sing to Sesame Street and I loved to right. dance around. But I came out really shell-shocked because I was in the hospital for a long time, and I became... Uh, very distrustful of people, obviously, because I'd been poked and prodded. A and, recluse. Yeah, you know, so I, I just, uh, at three, four, five, I was very shy. So I saw my sister, we moved to Hollywood, Florida, which is this tiny little place close to yeah. Miami. And I, I don't know, I like as a kid, I thought, you know, Ginger on Gilligan's Island would talk about Hollywood being so glamorous. And as a kid, I was like, I really get it. And I didn't yeah, realize, yeah. I thought I was in Hollywood, you know? So I see my sister in a play and I said to my mom, I want to try that. I want to try out for a musical. Right. And my mom loved me very much, but thought that I would basically take like a gigantic shit on the stage. She thought she would take me to audition and that this shy little child would get up and just not be able to right. do it. So she was like, your sister can take you. So uh, I ended up getting the part of Oliver in Oliver because um, they needed a girl to hit the high notes. Oh, wow. And I ended up, I don't really remember much about it. I was nine, but I remember singing on stage with the spotlight and feeling more like myself than I had felt in years 
while I was playing somebody else. Oh, ironically. because of what, because how you felt before was so. Yeah. And it, now there you feeling comfortable. I felt alive. And safe and, yeah. I felt safe for the wow. first time. And so I got really into musical theater, which as you can imagine, didn't make me popular in junior high and high school, but I was doing like every dinner theater in Florida. I worked at Golden Apple Dinner Theater, Country Music Playhouse, like all of them doing uh, just sort of, you know, like hoofing along, learning how to tap dance and sing. And um, so that was what my age? life. What, what, what age was that? Nine to 15. Dang. Yeah. So I tell my, my husband, because my husband was quarterback of the football team. And, and he said, what were you like in high school, like on our first date? He said, you never would have talked to me. And he said, really? And I said, no, 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 because everybody was doing Bartles and James and I was doing Rodgers and Hammerstein. <laughs> like, like I was the weird theater geek and I loved it though. And I, then I, I took a trip to New York when I was 15 with my mom and I thought, A, this is where I need to be because everybody is into theater and musicals. And this is just, I again, I feel alive here in a way that, that Florida wasn't exactly doing it yeah. for me. And then the other thing was, sort of like it's a city of freaks i felt like oh right this right. is where everybody goes when they're different and they don't fit in and, that's right and uh so i fell in love it with new york and then i met you because i ended up getting a manager who had me fly back and forth to audition for all my children now i met you and there was no google my friend so i get there and they're like you're gonna screen test i was like i don't know what the fuck a screen test is but i guess i'm just i'm yeah. doing something yeah. and i met you like your dimples were the first thing that i saw when i went to go screen test and again i didn't know what the hell i was doing i saw another girl rehearse with you and she was looking up and down a lot while she talked i thought oh i guess tv actresses look up and down a lot while they talk i didn't know wow. but you were great you were yeah. so kind and welcoming and and i remember that day so clearly. and then we didn't work together no no, I wish we had. Well, I, who did you work with? Uh, Trent Boucher. Trent Boucher was yeah. like a friend of mine yeah. a little bit. Yeah, he was David Rompal, and I had this big crush on him. And then they, they did sort of this strange 180. Then I found out that my father was a pimp on the show, not in real life. My father was a pimp. It wasn't Creed, right? No, it was no. Uh, Billy Clyde. Oh, yeah, you can act. That was cool. He was great, right? Yeah, he was terrific. Yeah. And then my mother was a prostitute. My stepmother was a prostitute and my stepfather was a gambler. So then my second year on the show, I called my character Misty Dead Eye because all I did was cry. All I did was look around oh. with these misty dead eyes. Like, how long were you there? Two years. That's two how years. long I was there. Really? Two years and three months. You made a very big impression in a short period. Of and, time. I, and I just said, I'm leaving because I want to go to LA and be a movie star and all that. Yeah. I, I thought I you were there for that. a lot longer. They two years and then they signed me for three extra months and they paid me nicely. I bet. And uh, I left. Wow. But that's a trip. Man. But oh, so yeah, I was telling you though, in between when I met you at the screen test, um, just my our lives changed pretty radically because uh, I had flown up with my mom. My mom was not a stage mother, like she was always saying to me, if you want to quit, quit, figure out who Good. you are aside from this. Uh, don't base your self-esteem on this because you're going to hear no a lot more than you're going to hear yes. So we fly up for this really glamorous screen test. I meet you. I have a great time. I had to sing for the role, which was also super cool for Henry Kaplan. Do you remember him? We had that director, right? Didn't he wear like little rubber monsters on his finger? He is on my ass for so long. Oh, my God. Are you sexy? Yes. Then act it. Remember? <laughs> and he's like, are you supposed to be upset in this scene? Yes. Then act it. I was 16. I peed my pants, man. He was <laughs> kind of mean all the time. He was terrified. Until the end, I guess he liked me, but. Dude, he was terrified. He would be like, what are you doing? Oh, yeah. Take, you know, talk. That's the thing. He used to tell me to talk louder. Don't take time. Don't put your hand on your face. So what am I supposed to do? <laughs> <laughs> he's. And he'd do it in front of everybody, too. There's a, there's a joke when I started GH. I said, uh, everybody knows now, but but everybody on the actors and everybody knows that I said to Wendy Rich and Shelly Curtis, I said, I'll take the job, right? But don't tell me to talk louder. Okay. So the first day I go in, I'm in a strip joint, and the director, Joe Behar, was tough like Kaplan. We can't hear you over the intercom. So I paused. Oh, I did it. Did it again. We can't hear you. I didn't do it, and I didn't do it for two years. 
And then it became crazy. Like if you gave me that note, and I'm not proud of this. I'm not telling actors, but if you gave me that note, I would break furniture. Oh my God. I would yell. Sometimes they forget. Oh my and, God. And I just told this to somebody else. One time this, this director, brand new first day, he said it over the intercom. They go, no. Oh shit. Don't tell them that. What? God, that's really funny. Talk louder. Get better microphones. Talk louder. Get better <laughs> but, microphones. But Liz, that's what I, because I would fight with the producer. This is the beginning, first couple of years. And I'd say, because what you just said, I said, mic me. Yeah. If you can't, mic me. I'm not going to ruin my acting. And I did, and, and now everybody can talk at a normal pace. I started the trend. We'll see what you've done. See, there you go. Yeah, you've saved all of them that, that have come after <laughs> hi, you. Hi, hi. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> upset. Yeah, I remember they used to fix my lip gloss when my character had a uh, my character had a miscarriage, and they were like, "Check her lip gloss." I was like, "Yes, because that matters." <laughs> Thank you. Make sure my hair looks okay after I just lost my child. <gasps> awesome. Um, but no, so wait, so I when I when I screen tested, so uh, my mom and I flew home, and I, I was I was telling you that uh, my father was gone by the time I got home. So my father, as it turns out, had fallen in love with somebody else. Uh, oh, my father was a minister. It turns out it had been going on for a period of time. My mother knew I did not. So in between meeting you, I mean, I'm not saying you caused this, yeah, right. but, no, but in between <laughs> meeting you and then uh, coming back and getting the job, what happened was, you know, I flew to New York. I had a dad. I flew home. I didn't. He was gone. He'd moved. He was living with this other person. And uh, my mom and I lived in a home that was owned by the church because he was a minister. So we, uh, we didn't know what we were going to do because I had graduated high school a year early because I wanted out because, like I said, it wasn't a pleasant experience. So I thought, well, I'll go early admission to college. And my mom will get the first job she's ever had in her life. And, wow. uh, and then I got the soap. So my mom and my grandmother, Gaga, where the three of us moved to Hell's Kitchen together and lived on 52nd and 8th in this one bedroom apartment. And it was like, you know, it was like the estrogen brigade. It was yeah. these three women from three different generations. We lived in Hell's Kitchen. You did? Yeah, 59th. Oh, oh, you were right around the corner. Yeah. So it was, it was. So amazing. how does that, what does that do to you? As a, as a, were you 16? 16. When your dad has an affair and leaves your mom, I mean, is that, how, how bad does it hurt? How bad do you still see your dad after? Is it different? Is it? Um, so I was 16 and I, I was very close with my mom and I became closer with my mom. She became like two parents to me. I didn't speak to my father for a long period of time. Uh, at the time I would have said I was fine because you know, I went to therapy. My mom immediately put me in therapy after he left to make sure that I was handling it okay. Now, here's something. I started acting when I was nine, and uh, you develop certain skills. And so when I was 16, sitting with a therapist, uh, you know, I I, I, exactly. I I acted really well with yes. him and um, and played it off like, like it was fine and it was okay. And we were moving forward, which which we were. Um, and I, you know, at the time I thought, oh, it's, 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 it's okay. So this is a thing that happened. And then later, um, it definitely had an effect on my ability to trust people. Uh, obviously it definitely had an effect on the men that I started choosing, um, to date because I became intensely commitment phobic. And I was just talking about this with a friend. I was, I was never afraid somebody would cheat on me. I was always thinking, what if I'm my dad? What if I commit and I mess this up? What if I end up having an affair? Really? What if I, yeah, I really did. I, I became intensely commitment phobic because I'm a runner in, in life. I, I love to actually physically run. It is very yeah. calming to me, but I'm a runner inside too. Uh, so I would get in these relationships on purpose that I knew were never going to work out. And I can look back and go, you know, I, I chose a lot of people who had uh, drinking problems and drug problems, and I would come into their lives, and I'm, I, my default is optimism, and I would sort of make them happy for a while, and that was a great thing to feed my ego, and it was fun for them. And then, then you'd go. Yeah, well, then I was still the same drug, but I wasn't fulfilling the same purpose in their lives, and so things would start to go wrong, and then I'd be like, I knew it was never going to work, and then I would leave, and I, and I, so I ran away from a lot of relationships, and I, or, and or just picked people where I knew it would never 
it would never work because I, I just really didn't want to get married. Like I, I didn't want to settle down. I never thought I would settle down. And, uh, I went through one more bad relationship. And for some reason, one night I thought, it's like I'm dating the same man over and over again. And they just have different names. Like it was all the same issues. And, and look, I'm friends with a lot of my exes. They're terrific. We just were bad matches. You know, yeah, I mean, you yeah. could be two terrific people and just not gel. Um, and so I went into therapy to start discussing what I needed to do. And I, I remember the therapist said to me, I think you need to, uh, change your definition of love. What is love to you? And I realized that I would meet these people and you get that stomach flippy feeling and you get sort of, you know, obsessed with this person and they're right, obsessed right. with you and it feels great. And the therapist helped me realize I didn't really have a great template to look at. You know, when your dad leaves when you're 16, it's not like I can look at my parents in this long lasting relationship together and watch them grow old together and see what I want. And so I, I thought, okay, first of all, I'm okay with being alone. And I really was okay with being alone. And I was, oh, you are okay with being alone. Yeah, I am. Yeah. I mean, you know, talk to me about the pandemic. I like, I'm very happy. I was with somebody yeah. during that, yeah. but, but then I also thought, I just want to meet somebody who helps me breathe. I don't need the stomach flippy feeling. I, I realized that was a lot of anxiety over being with somebody that I wasn't sure was going to stay. Can I get them to stay? Do I want to stay? It was all this drama. It was was that exciting to you? It was terribly exciting, you know? I mean, terribly exciting yeah. and sexy and fun. And, yeah. you know, and, and ultimately I can look at it and go, great. I had a great time in my 20s. And I, but I then decided that if I ever wanted to settle down or at least have one healthy adult relationship in my life that I just sort of had to look for something different and I swear it was just it was maybe a couple months later and I got cast in a movie it was terrible and uh I didn't want to do it I called my agent well this was weird right so I I was my agent sends me the script that morning and says you have to go read for this movie now my agent was like you know eight and nine tenths months pregnant and so she was like I'm leaving to go have this child go audition for this movie and go get it I read it and I was like this is crap. And she said, no, you have to go do this because I'm going to have a baby and I want to make sure you're doing a movie. I was like, but it's crap. And also you sent it to me today and I can't go read for this in a couple hours. I don't even have time to work on it. She's like, don't worry about it. Just go. Uh, you, I know you have a lunch thing. So go from that, go straight to the audition. I was like, rawr, rawr. so I do. And I, rawr, rawr, rawr. and I walk into the audition and I break my boot on the way in. And I was like, rawr, rawr, rawr. and then they go, they go, can you do a Texas accent? And I was like, no, because I got the script this morning and I would work with the dialect That's coach. That's what you said? Yeah, yeah, I said, but I'm not going to do a bad Texas accent because you're going to send this to the star of the movie who's from Texas and I'm going to sound terrible. Wow. So I said, no, I, I'll, but you know, I will, Good I will pay you. for my own dialect coach, but let's just do this, you know, with my, with my normal voice. So I read, and this is the only time it's ever happened to me in my entire career. She goes, I think you're going to get this. And I was like, mark, mark. And she goes, yeah, I think you're going to get this. And I was like, oh, shit. So I I leave and I call my friend and I go, I think I'm shooting this movie. I, I'm going to go to Texas and shoot this thing. Maybe I'll meet a nice guy on the crew. So I get there and uh, the star was uh, quite a personality. So there was a lot to handle because I was playing his partner. So um, I was pretty much myopically focused on that for the first couple of days, just sort of trying to keep them cool. And um about the third day in, I noticed the camera operator and I went into the makeup and hair trailer and I said, hey, that guy's dreamy. Like why I'm suddenly from 1947, I don't know. But I was like, the dude's dreamy. And they go, we want to tell him. And I was like, don't tell him. And they go, no, we want to tell him. I was like, don't tell him. <laughs> so then I'm shooting the movie and the co-star is sitting there with me and we're in a car. I was like, check out the steady cam guy. Like he's hot, right? And the lead actor's like, rawr, rawr, rawr. and I said, like, no, I mean, he's hot, right? Look at that smile, like he's hot. So, um, I'm, and then I ended up talking to the steady cam operator, to David, and our first conversation, I had had these cats that I wanted to name Flotsam and Jetsam, and my then boyfriend wasn't nuts about the names, so we didn't name them that, and uh, my first conversation with David, I go, do you have any pets? And by the way, my character was shot, so I'm there with a gaping chest wound on the ground, like, blah, right. blah, blah, and they're cut, so we're waiting, and I'm stuck on the ground, and I look up at the camera operator, David, and I'm like, you got any pets? And he goes, yeah, I do, I have, uh, I have three cats, I have Bonnie, Clyde died, and then I have Flotsam and Jetsam. And I was like, yeah? And he goes, Flotsam and Jetsam. And I just was, and then every single thing kept matching up with him in a way that I've never experienced before. Like the things that he said was down the list, everything I was looking for uh, in a human. And so by the end of shooting that movie, I was like, all right, I get it. 
then I came back here and our entire relationship was emailing for two months. We just emailed back and forth because he was still shooting the rest of the movie. And we fell, which was perfect because then there was no chance to be all, to just get too swept away with the physicality of it or just that, you know, yeah. we just we got to know each other. I was in love with him before I'd even gone on a date officially with him and he felt the same way. So by the time he came back to LA, we were like, oh my God. God, we hope that there's some attraction whatsoever because we're in love, you know? And then there was. So you can actually get in love without having the normal. My dude gives good email. Like we, we, <laughs> we, we really. We now, with, on this love. movie with this famous dude or whatever, actor, it was a hard shoot. Did your guy help you through that? Uh, he oh, didn't, no. I, well, I didn't know him. And also I just, uh, oh, I just mean, said. I, when I work with difficult people and I, I've been really blessed to work with some wonderful, nice, cool people who realize how lucky but we there are. are, but there's some clunkers, you yes. know, they're out there. And, um, my husband calls it poking the bear. Like yeah. I have this thing. Uh, I think once you realize if you get fired, you don't die. And that was a huge epiphany to me. I got yeah. fired from a job once and I was like, what do you know? I still woke up. Birds are singing. Everything is fine. So you start getting a little, uh, you know, you, you get a hard candy coating, you know? And I, and so when I work with actors like that, there's a quote in the movie Gia, uh, where Angelina Jolie says, you got to scare them before they scare you. I subscribe to that. So, really? uh, so this star, you know, I was just like, I, I, I couldn't stop. I would make fun of him. I would, I, you know, and, and I would, I would tell him things like he didn't care. And I would sit there and tell him to check out the camera operator's ass. I'm like, look at that ass. Look at that tight ass, you know? And the, and the actor, it threw him for a loop because a lot of people, they, yeah. they treat these people with such reverence yeah, 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 that right. I think it kind of sticks out sometimes yes. when there's somebody going, you don't scare me. Yeah, I I refuse to be scared by you. You know, I I did uh, I played John Gotti in a, a Lifetime movie, right? And I became now I'm friends with Victoria Gotti, but at the first day I just told Paul, "Get me on a plane. I can't do this fucking role, right?" And the executive producer hated me. Really? Hated me. And I've never had that. Now I didn't subscribe to what you just said. I was just, I was just. I didn't know I, I was all thrown, man. And I had to play this, you know, the everything, accent, this, that, this. So I didn't get anxiety because that's what kills me. I don't know that, I, but I got scared. Yeah. And like a little boy, but not anxiety. Because if I had anxiety, it had been over. It would have been done. Couldn't have done it. But. What I did was I said, okay, I'll just, I'll use the method, and I'll become John Gotti all the time on set. Mm -hmm. And let that, and so every time she'd be on the set and I'd walk by her, I'd go. Kind of, I guess it's kind of yeah. what, yeah. what you're saying yeah. then. Yeah. Without me knowing that. Yeah. It, it worked. So, the, it, you know, it, it and actually my performance was better. Yeah. Because I was somebody else. I may not have been John Gotti, but I was somebody else. Yeah. So I know, yeah. Wow. So then you, you, you're you with, then in three months, he asked you to marry him. Uh, no, he knew me really well there too. I mean, I am... Uh... I'm an adamant believer in my life anyway. I want, uh, I want everything to be equal. I'm not a huge fan of uh, gender bias, gender roles in general. Like he knew I wasn't the type of woman who wanted to be asked to be married. Like he, no, was, like, he, really? he actually, the way he proposed was we were, well, first we went out with my dear friend. I've had the same best friend since I was nine. Like we met in church choir and we had to be friends because I was the girl with the buck teeth and frizzy hair wearing a Pac-Man t-shirt and she had like headgear and braces, you know, so we had to be friends by default because no one else would talk to us. So Bert, we call each other Bert. So my dear Bert, her real name's Juliet, but she's Bert to me. So I went out with her in New York and I'd taken David to New York for his birthday when he had come back from shooting the movie. And we all, uh, you know, had a couple martinis and, um, Bert had just gotten married and she was talking about how great marriage was. And there was a pause. David looks up and he goes, I haven't even met Liz's mother yet. 
And so it was clearly on his mind a lot. And I started laughing hysterically because I was like, what are you thinking about, dude? He's like, I know, it's in my head. So when we flew home, <laughs> it was just so funny. I haven't even met her mother yet. It was like, wow. And you're like, take it easy. Yeah, we hadn't even, we hadn't even been broached. I mean, it had been three months, <laughs> you know? So uh, we were flying home and then he just looked at me and he said, we're gonna do that, right? And I went, yeah, yeah. And he said, should we go ring shopping? And I said, yeah, we should. So I don't know, like somewhere over Texas, we just discussed how we were gonna get married. And I got home and I called my family. I said, I, I think I'm engaged. And, uh, and the whole thing was so strange to them because they were so used to me running and not committing. And I remember my mom, she said, you sound weird when you talk about him. And I said, weird how? She said, you just sound so sure. It's never a complaint or, or anxiety. I mean, I've been engaged before I, I met him. Oh, and I really? broke out in hives. Like I, <laughs> this, was, this was a runaway bride, but not funny. And, um, and with him, it was just, it was calm, you know, because it was the right kind of love. It was, it was, yeah, and yeah. it's been 18 years and it's, it's the real deal. Like we, we are still just grossly in love with each other. See, that's the beauty. Yeah. Especially in Hollywood where I I won't name any names, but it's it's all falling apart with these marriages and people dying and it's amazing. Lately, in the last six months, seven months I think. Yeah. Friends of mine and you know, this and that. It's but eighteen years is and I've been well, how many? Over thirty. Congratulations. <laughs> I don't know exactly how many, but it's it's a beautiful thing. And I found, you know, since I've been with him, I lost uh, I lost five family members in a short period of time, including my mother. And his mother ended up having to have brain surgery, and then there was the pandemic, and you know, job losses, and just uh, you know, some some really serious shit. And what I realized is, you pick the right person, and none of the drama has to come from the relationship because life hands you enough. I mean, aren't we all exhausted? Like, just having a partner that is there for me, who has my back, who's I mean, he's just, he is, he is my true north. He is my constant. He is, he is wonderful. And he was with me through all of that, uh, which was invaluable. And how lucky you are, I am, that whoever you believe in, God, or whatever, has given us that. Yeah. Because so many people either think they have it and it wasn't, or never get it. Yeah. Oh, I'm I'm grateful. You know, How I, I amazing, right? I think every night what I'm grateful for. Um, I just find it calming, and and uh, it's something I, I have I've been doing for years. And he's always top of the list. That's you know, and I am a very spiritual person. Like I, I have some issues with some aspects of religion. organized religion. And, yeah. But I'm a very spiritual person, Me and too. um, my mom. And we can get into this, but my mom was very ill. My mom was in a coma for a long time, and I uh, I was in Atlanta. And first of all, she was treated at Emory. And so she had to go in for brain surgery, and she ended up being in a coma after that. But David got a movie to shoot in Atlanta, 15 minutes away from Emory Hospital, where she went in for brain surgery. He started the movie two days before her surgery. So then I was there, and then she went into a coma. He was there for three months at this apartment, 15 minutes away from Emory, where I could stay with him. Um, and visit my mom every day. Wow. So I had a place to stay. And then one day, this whole experience, it was like being, you know that whole, whole story about you put a frog in water and you turn it up gently and it can be boiling and the frog never notices because it happened so gradually. Yeah. Like, I felt like that because it kept getting worse and it kept getting worse. And uh, I had to fly home for something for work. And I remember I was, I was just exhausted. And I sat down at the, in the airport and I just, I thought, I'm, I'm breaking right now, I'm breaking, and I have to fly back to LA, and I, it, it was horrible, and I, I get this phone call from Bert, from my dearest friend, and I'll never forget, she said, uh, hey, I'm thinking about you, I'm at the Atlanta airport. I said, you're at the Atlanta airport? I'm at the Atlanta airport. She said, it was the weirdest thing, I was in Tampa visiting my parents, and I was trying to fly home to Key West. They rerouted my plane north. I ended up in Atlanta, and I'm stuck here. Where are you? And I told her what gate I was waiting at, and I was four gates away from it. So my dearest friend came and sat next to me and held me Whoa. before I got in the airplane. And so I just look at that and go, you know, thank you, thank you. 
thank you, God, universe, whatever it is that you are yeah. for guarding me during the worst period yeah, of no my life. No coincidences. No, it was, I mean, it was really astonishing, particularly because when does your plane get rerouted no. north? No. You know? No. Um, and then my husband's job uh, finished down there like three days after my mom's memorial. So. When was this? Uh, 2012. We're coming on 10 years. Yeah. Um, my dad just passed away about seven months ago. I'm so sorry. I always thought that, uh, I talk about this with my sister, I always thought the grief would have the decency to be linear. Like I thought, so stupid, but I thought, you know, like we go through anger. You know, maybe it's the sad stage. And I didn't realize that even 10 years in, I'll get angry. Like I'll, I'll see something that just makes me so angry that she's gone. It's like, oh, there's the anger. And then I also... Some things will make me deeply sad, and they're never the things I expect, but I'd the say, yeah. weirdest buttons. Yeah. yeah. I, I I was watching a movie. Iron, Iron Giant? Iron Giant. It's an animated I, movie. I know. It's a beautiful movie. Beautiful movie. I was trying to rewatch it with David after my mom had passed away, and there's some line about nothing really dies. We're always here forever. I was like, click. I can't. I can't. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm crying at a cartoon. Like, it's just, it, but uh, it did it. That was a button, and I thought, okay, that, we'll put that on the list of things that I cannot watch uh, yeah. for, for, for a little while. Um, you know, for me, with grief, I, I always say that uh, death always eventually you'll find a gift somewhere like my friend that got murdered um i got angry i wanted to kill the guy who did it and uh he stabbed my buddy for like 18 times you know Jeez, I'm sorry. and he went to his house and tried to burn it down actually this is interesting because and then he tried to kill himself and the cops got him and then they wanted me to testify in court because they wanted to say that he was mentally ill, you know. So I, I didn't end up going, thank God, because it was tough for me. He kills my best friend, but I'm pro mental health. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I remember sitting out at my house thinking about him crying. And I look up, and there's three hawks just going. And I knew it was Manny. I said, I don't know. I said, yeah, I've never seen three hawks. I've seen two, but not three. And then another person, I've had five people, like five or six people not die also. And I've never said bye to any of them. Oh, God. Is that, a, is that, yeah, I've never said bye to any of them. Another person died, Donna, my makeup artist, and I know she left me strength because I felt strong. Yeah. I didn't feel. So we always, I think, should find the gift in the death, and it makes it easier. Also, because my mom, I talked to my mom, and, you know, it's hard, right? Yeah. She's with him for 60 years, I guess. I don't know how many. And... Whether you believe in God or you don't believe in God, it's this, like you said, it, this, it's hard enough trying to do it alone. But when you have a higher power, it's going to make it easier. And also, I believe with death, if you really believe, because I truly believe there's a much better place than this rat race. I do too. I'm, only, I'm <laughs> smiling because my sister and I talk about this all the time. And my sister is much more, um, she, she's much more by the book than I am. So my sister and I talk about this all the time and she goes, well, what do you think it's like after you die? And I said, you know, I don't know. I don't know that you can even describe it because I don't know that puny earth brains have any sort of ability to describe it. I said, so I, I don't know. And she goes, well, I do. And I said, y you do? And she's like, yeah. So you see everybody that you love and maybe you're like at the age that you think is really the, your best age and you, and you see them and you, and you hug them. I mean, if it's not that, I'm going to be upset. And I said, you're telling me that in the infinite wisdom of what you believe in, whatever God universe that you have, that, that, that it won't be better than like, like, I love that she's already predetermined that she's going to be disappointed if heaven isn't the way that she wants yeah, it right. to be. I was like, it'll, it'll be better. It's got to. It'll, Look, it'll be I, better. I do. It's in my book. Um, New York Times bestseller. No. <laughs> um, I, I do a meditation. And I'll do it now just for people who are, that's the beauty. 
beautiful thing about state of mind is these people who watch they they'll listen to us and feel like they're not alone and maybe they can get something from us that you know so i i listened to a meditation about coming down some stairs right and they kind of ended there but it was a thing and i said i'm going to add this so i do this meditation where i and i've done it and every time i've done it man i'm talking tears pop they don't just come down they're popping out of me okay so i come down the stairs real slow and i end up coming down come down come down and i see a door and i open the door and what i see is a bunch of beautiful flowers you know roses and stuff and i see this like football field of beautiful grass and i'll tell you this after this remind me because i forget all the time and then i see a waterfall on the left and a building on the right which i don't know what the building is and i see people kids and playing and stuff and then i go and i lay down and i've done it with everybody that has died my dad i did it last the last time and i close my eyes i'm laying down in this grass and then i open my eyes and it's my dad right in front of me and so to me that's heaven right yeah yeah and then i don't hear what we're talking about i just see it i see him and i talking and then he hugs me and then i leave go back up the stairs right well there's a book that my mom got about people who have seen heaven and there's a pictures in there i said describe the picture to me and it's exactly what the oh god <sighs> man do you do you dream about him no ever ever really i don't think i've ever had one dream which is trippy too it is i didn't for a while oh you didn't for I, a while for a while um well i i i had lost uh great uncle, a great aunt Gaga, who was uh, my grandmother who moved to New York with us. She lived to be 94. By the way, she she played poker. She drank Bailey's <laughs> Irish cream. She was my definition of glamour, like as a child. She was like Auntie Mame. She would come in and the way she dressed and smelled like perfume. She was, God, she was amazing. She passed away. My dad passed away, uh, at which point I did go back and uh, make peace with him before he passed away. I haven't seen him in a very, wow. very long time. Um, and then, uh, and then my mom, um, and I didn't dream about my mom for the longest time, but now lately I can't stop. And she always, she's healthy and she's just there. It's like, I'm hanging with her and it's yeah. the most beautiful thing. You know, I wake up and I'll, I'll tell David that I dreamed about her again. He'll be like, what'd you do? You know what? We just walked through the street and met. We just, we were hanging and, uh, it's like a, a beautiful little hello. And I never think about her when she was sick. It's just yeah. always her. Um, and I always feel like it's a it's a special oh yeah visit from her um, yeah yeah maybe it comes when uh, when it's maybe. supposed to maybe it would have been too much to dream about her too early on so I want to really talk to you about this documentary called Human Race is it yeah that's cool man thanks tell me about that um after my mom passed away running was I, I've always been athletic but running became very important and sacred to me uh, it it gave me something to do every morning it gave me an outlet for anger for frustration for it just it was it became a huge part of my life you know I wake up I go for a run and uh one day I just thought when do I have to stop doing this logically like is there a time when I basically have to start speed walking like I, is there an age is there a number like at 68 do you speed walk at 75 do you mall walk is there like <laughs> pinochle involved I don't even know what pinochle is like what do you have to what do I do so I looked online and I saw all these people were running uh 5ks 10ks marathons, ultra marathons, uh, at the ages of 65, 70, and 75. And, uh, and I was amazed. And I've also uh, been an adamant uh, hater of isms, uh, any isms. Uh, you know, you got your racism, your sexism, your ageism. And uh, living in Hollywood where the ageism is, you know, made, uh, I thought I want to make something that shows people of a certain age in a certain light. Because I think we all sort of suffer from this delusion that 
older people are cute, you know, they're yeah. cute, or occasionally they let them rap in movies with Adam Sandler, you know, and I thought, right. I want to show them be fierce. These are athletes. They're fierce. Yeah. When I say that, I mean, some of these times, like, they kick my ass, people two decades older than I am. So I thought, uh, I'm going to make a documentary. And it was at a uh, time in our political life when I was uh, not happy. And I thought, I'm going to put something bright into the world because otherwise I'm on Twitter going, you know, yeah. and I thought, I'm tired of putting anger out there. I want to fix something. I want to put a light out there. So I decided I was going to make a documentary. Now I'm married to a camera operator, so that was great. Oh, okay. And he's used to, I mean, he feels like he's married to Lucille Ball from the Lucy show. Like, I, I just, like, I have, these, I have an idea. And he's like, oh, my God, what do we have to do now? But he's like, okay, cool. I'll make a documentary with you, even though we both have no idea what we're doing. So I put out a little missive out on social media going, do you run? Are you over 50? And I was just barraged with people writing to me because they wanted to be seen. And they wanted to get the message out there that you're never too old to start. So I got, uh, the first person I got a message from was a woman who was in her mid fifties who had beaten cancer several times and run the perimeter of the United States. And dang. she, yeah, dang, she was about to run all the middle states. And she said, do you want to come watch me train? And I was like, yes, I do. So I said, babe, I think we're starting to shoot. So we fly to Arizona. She's at this gym. She'd just come back from another surgery. She has the portal and everything, the port. And she, um, portal, like she's going to another dimension. No, she had the port for her medication. So she uh, is doing all these exercises and I try to do some with her. Now, as I said, I run every day. I mean, I'm good. I'm in good shape. Like I take care of myself. Couldn't keep up with her already. Like really? her, it was the most intense workout I've ever seen. And because uh, she was getting ready to do such an intense run. So I start following her. And then I thought, you know, I want to I should probably get like some sort of sponsor or somebody to help me because this is really expensive. And I want to make sure that once it's distributed, that people will see it. So I ended up calling an insurance company. And, you know, being in the business since you're a fetus, you get sort of like immune to no. So I was like, what's the worst thing they can say? So I was like, do you want to sponsor my documentary? And they said, uh, you know, our spokesperson is Catherine Switzer. Well, Catherine Switzer was the first woman to run the Boston Marathon as a bibbed entry in 1967 when women were being told that, and I am kid you not, 1967, women were told you would lose your uterus if you ran, your uterus would fall wow. out, you would grow hair on your chest. And uh, basically Catherine at the time was like, you know, fuck that noise, I'm going to run. So she got a coach and she told her coach, I will run with you and prove that I can do this. And she ran 30 miles and her coach passed out. So the coach was like, I will coach you. So she goes in the Boston Marathon in 1967. She signed up uh, as KV Switzer, which are her, you know, her initials. The race director was really pissed that it was a woman. So there is a famous picture of her being pushed out of the race by the race director really? early on. And um, she was dating a, uh, a football player, a huge guy who pushed that guy and brought her back in. And she finished the marathon, and her quote is, I was gonna do it on my hands and knees if I had to, but I was gonna prove that women could do this. So out of the blue, I write to her, and I'm a huge fan of hers as a feminist and as an athlete, yeah. and I go, hey, you know, this insurance company that you, you know, are spokesperson for, they're interested in you doing this. I would love if you'd do anything. And she wrote back, and I was like, wow, oh my God. So she said, what would you like me to do? I said, literally anything you want to do. And I said, you could do the voiceover. She said, well, actually, I'm training at the age of 70 to run the New York City Marathon. Do you want to come film me training? Oh, I was you, like, you got God. it. So I go and I watch her train. And we ended up finding like a guy in his mid 50s who was going to do a 100 mile race in the mountains, um, like at 13,000 feet, an 80 year old training for a half marathon. Um, and so I did all different lengths of races because I wanted to show you don't have to be an ultra marathon runner, but just get up and walk around the block yeah, if you can. Right, Movement right. is medicine, you know? So uh, I had an incredible time, shot the whole thing, got a distributor, and then it was hysterical because then they wrote me, they said, here are your deliverables. And I was like, uh, okay. Now, I'd never been on this side of things before, so I was like, oh, What cool. do you mean deliverables? Well, I'm Googling it while yeah. I'm on the phone with them, and I'm like, sort of Oh, yeah. So you mean the blah, blah, blah. I'm reading it online. And then I so I, I Googled my way through this. I Forrest Gumped my way through post-production because I had no idea what I was doing. And I just kept asking questions. And I learned all about, I mean, the cameras I knew about, both from being in the business and then yeah. my husband. But just, I mean, 
honestly, post-production supervisors, whatever they're being paid, it's not enough. It was, it was harder than I've ever worked in my life, but I got the whole thing together and uh, had a huge premiere at my agency and then it uh, got globally distributed. So um, it can be found anywhere. Uh, and it's, I get these letters from people saying I'd never run before, I'm 60 yeah. years old, but I wanna make it really clear. Like I, I, and I make it clear in the documentary, I understand people have different physical challenges. A, I'm not saying everybody should run a marathon. Um, I, right, what right, I make right. really clear is whatever you can do, if you can do anything, do it because you'll feel better for having done it. Right. Um, so people are writing me going, you know, I walked three blocks today. Fan fucking tastic. Or I'm running a marathon. Yeah, also you. fan fucking tastic. Yeah. But then I got roped into it. And um, the New York City Marathon people that I'd met when I was following Catherine, they said, do you want to run it next year? We'll grandfather you in. I was like, yeah. I said, can my husband run it with me? So I tell him we're running the marathon. And he was like, oh my God, what have you gotten me into now? But we trained. How many miles? Uh, 26.2. So you we did that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we ran New York in 2018, um, and it was. How sore were you after? Not so sore. I did a. No. I did the training. I mean, the training is intense. Like you wake up and you run. You run a lot through the you week, depending felt, on. You just did. You that do, zone, but right? you get those miles on your legs. Like you do, uh, like a 12 mile run on a weekend, and then you'll do 13, 14. You go up to 20. You don't have to go past that. But you know, I did like a 20 mile training run. And um, it is a very intense training. And then in the marathon, what a lot of people don't tell you though, and I think it's a, it's a good metaphor for, uh, for life actually, you're running, everybody stops to walk. Everybody stops to walk to drink water. They oh, stop right, when they're tired. Right. Like, you know, you okay, have this sort of, yeah. I mean, except for the elite runners, but, but 20... uh, oh, it's a long, yeah, it's a long, it's a long haul. So we did that. And then uh, Catherine said, do you want to run Boston for me for oh, my charity? My. So I said, yes. But then I, uh, I had a really bad fall when I was training. And ironically, my, my running times were better than they'd ever been. This is last year. And for some reason, I don't know why, but I was running like, I mean, it was like, I was like a bat out of hell. And I was so happy that I was running. I tripped uh, at the Hollywood Reservoir and I fell on mile two on my 19 mile run. And I could tell... <laughs> I could tell as we could go to bed. I could tell I was bleeding. Uh, I could tell since I was holding my uh, my iPhone, I could tell that my hand had been sort of crushed around it when I and I kept running. So I did my 19 miles. Oh I come home and I and I say to David, I was like, "Don't panic." So he sees me and I've got blood running down my cheek. Oh I've got and I didn't realize how bad the fall was. But the next day, my hands my hand looked like and I mean you should see pictures. It looked like. It looked like I gained 80 pounds in my hand. It looked like a different person. So I went and they did x-rays and they said, miraculously, this is not broken, um, but it's you have to make sure that you massage it. And they gave me exercises. But I also tweaked some other stuff when I fell. So I had to say to Catherine, I can't in good conscience run this because I, I think I'll hurt myself in the long, long haul if I do. So I had made a lot of money for her charity saying I was going to run it. So I walked the virtual version. So the people that gave money didn't feel gypped. Oh, yeah, so I yeah. walked 26.2 miles. And let me tell you, that's actually harder than walking, than running it because it's- it takes longer. Oh my God. It was, it was <laughs> like interminable. Because I, like, I, uh, I like going to walk. 26.2, man. That was- that was 26. Scary. Yeah. It took like six and a half hours. I mean, it was crazy. It was crazy. And I would mix it up. Like it I'd would go- take me about- 45 hours it was it was <laughs> crazy I and then I would go for a walk and I would come home and we have a treadmill and so then I was like I guess it's time to do some of it on the treadmill and I would drink and eat on the treadmill while I was walking and then I'd go back out and walk but it's the only way I could do it injured and not hurt myself that's, further. that's wow but that's a beautiful thing you did I, I want to see it oh please do I, yeah. I'm really proud of it the people in it are just extraordinary and the letters it's like it's inspiring it, it will inspire you in ways because it's not really about the running it's about uh, the it. human spirit yeah, and it's it. yeah so yeah. let's so one more thing uh, i want to talk because i have to talk about csi but you don't have to say anything you don't want to say but i just know from looking it up that you were very much loved on that show thanks very part you did it for how long five years Dang, yeah. you did it for five years. I did it for five years, and it was, um, I had- uh, I didn't know it was five years. See, I didn't know. Five I years. I know it was like a lot of years, but I didn't know it was five yeah, years. Yeah, I, uh, I was so grateful to get it, because I'd been auditioning, and uh, I would get on shows that really were sort of 
my speed, like the stuff that I really liked. I did a show that was based on an Elmore Leonard novel um, with Bo Bridges. It was called Maximum Bob. Loved it. It went for six episodes. I did The Tick, you which was everything, but it was all for six episodes. And like I then, know you that, know, yeah. and I did a couple things that went for a couple seasons, but like the ones that I loved would go for a little while. I did 10 pilots in a row that weren't picked up. Son so of a you like, you know, and after a while, you're just going, oh my God, like this is, it, you, you try to explain that to people who aren't in the business and they're like, but when can I see it? And you go, well, you, I no, mean, I know, you but, know, but the fact that you did 10 is, amazing. I, I was, is, yeah. look, I, I am, I mean, right under the husband. I'm so grateful for and the gift did that I've been CSI, getting. which went five years. So then I got on that, and they, they, uh, it was great because I would refer to it as CSI. I'm finally on something that doesn't seem to be getting canceled. <laughs> so like, I was like, yay! And it would come around. I'd go on hiatus. I was like, I didn't sink the ship yet. It's That's not not going down. Funny. So yeah, it was five years, and they let me write an episode um, in my fifth season, uh. and that's when everything changed for me because. Uh, Lawrence Fishburne was on the show at the time, um, who was just extraordinary. And the bastard had a, a, a memory like I've never seen. Really? Like he, yeah, it was photographic memory. So he uh, would basically look because all that jargon. Like I can tell you now, ten yeah. years later, collapse the schematic of the HDV rod structure with a Wang numbering system. The shit sticks because you have to run it ad nauseum to get it in your head and sound like you know what I you're talking hate about. That. It's 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 actually like it's it's tough because there's no emotion. I mean, you know, it's your it's facts, it's science. Um, so he could memorize it like that. But then they had me write an episode. But this wasn't David Caruso, right? No, no, no. I got uh, I got on the, the William Peterson flavor. Oh, okay. I was on the Vegas flavor <laughs> with Mark Helgenberger. And um, I mean, I've never even met the other. We never meet. Like, we just, right. yeah, we're all in the same show, basically, and none of us ever meet. Right. And they all shoot in Los Angeles, too. So <laughs> <laughs> people are like, how often did you go to Vegas? I was like, once for a party. I, I you know, we, yeah. we shot at Universal. But um, yeah, I wrote an episode and I was watching Watching, you know, Morpheus say these lines that I'd written. And I was like, it wasn't a, it wasn't Morpheus. like, a, it was so cool, you know? And I was going, I, I feel uh, so creative because I'd been acting since I was nine years old. And suddenly I felt creative in a way I hadn't felt for a while. Um, just because I thought that line didn't exist till I sat down at my laptop and I wrote it. I loved it. And I loved the pre-production, post-production, yeah. every last bit. So when I got off the show, I went on uh, Two and a Half Men for a little while. And um, I, that's, I saw you on that. Yeah, it was so much fun. I, I actually, despite the fact that that show has a lot of things said yeah. about it, I have to say, first of all, Chuck Lorre was very good to me. I ended up yeah. doing a bunch of his shows. And Charlie Sheen was a joy to work wow. with, a joy. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I played his girlfriend. So Chuck was happy because Charlie and I got along. I don't know what that says about me, but we got along. And then uh, Charlie broke. And then suddenly I was supposed to go back. And then suddenly I couldn't because Ashton Kusher was on it and it was a whole different storyline right, right. so i thought i'm gonna sit down and write a pilot because i got canned off of csi basically there was a change in the right. power and so i i got i got thrown out with a couple other people and then two and a half men was like okay well that's not going to go on any further and uh, i sat down and wrote a pilot and ended up selling it to nbc and um was just again overwhelmed with like I got the paycheck for that job and I don't mean monetarily speaking, but I looked at it and was like, this is the best money that I've ever made because I made this. I sat down and made this. This world didn't exist before I did it. And uh, it was a transformative time and I kept selling pilots and kept writing them. And um, and now it's where my focus is. Like I'd go back and act if the perfect yeah, role came course. along. But I mean, it's been it's been 10 years of like I've sold seven or eight pilots in a, a TV movie and a, um, Amazing. I just wrote a feature for a great company. I sold something recently that's a documentary series, sold another pilot with Mayim Bialik uh, producing it. So I love it. I mean, I. My husband is like, it's the only time I see you sit still for such a long period of time. I'm like Schroeder at the piano, That's you know, amazing. from Peanuts. Yeah. Like, type, 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 type. And um, it's been wonderful. It's been really great. Wow. I, I got to tell you, I to conclude this, I just say, that's what I always say. <laughs> To conclude this, that's like the, that's the way that I end. It's like, okay, when I say conclude, it's over. It sounded very formal. It was good. It was good. That's the word I like. Yeah. Because I don't want to say to end this or to. Um, this has been. I mean, just phenomenal. I'm telling you, it's it's so good for people to hear what came out of your mouth. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And again, thank you for doing oh, this. I mean, I'm no, such... it, it, look, I, I know what I do, but it's the it's the people who who are willing. 
because you get a lot of different types okay some are willing to talk more some are going deep but w what you did is you just there's a lot of things that i haven't talked about and i've been doing this now for a little bit so that's a beautiful thing and then the way you were saying it and your emotions and and i loved it man I just gotta tell you. I loved it too. Well, we have to do it. We'll do. We'll do a sequel. We'll do it too. We, yeah, I, I am gonna start doing part two. It's great. That's amazing. well. People are fascinating. Yeah, everybody's that's fascinating. What I'm saying. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. It's been phenomenal, and I love that we cried, <laughs> and I'll never forget that. I love seeing. <laughs>